Mr. Attorney General, we are glad to have you here. I just have two questions I'd like to ask you. There's been a lot said here, of course, about Judge Bulk firing Mr. Cox. I want to ask you one question on that. Do you think Judge Bulk acted in the best sense of the Department of Justice and the country when he fired Mr. Cox? Yes, I do, Senator Thurman. The other question I'd like to ask you, do you feel that Judge Bulk possesses the qualifications to make an outstanding Supreme Court Justice of the United States? And by that, I mean <clears throat> the qualifications that the American Bar Association uses, integrity, judicial temperament, and, and, uh, and competency as well as courage and dedication. You feel he possesses those qualities to make a good Supreme Court justice, and you know of any reason why the Senate should not confirm him. I have no hesitancy whatsoever, Senator Thurmond, in saying that I believe that he does possess, in an outstanding degree, all the qualities you just enumerated. As I said in my prepared statement, before I had had the opportunity to consider the testimony given to this committee by Judge Bork. I had some question as to whether some of his views reflected a sufficient degree of openness toward the evolving values of a changing society and whether he had a sufficient, would give a sufficient degree of weight to the president's of the Supreme Court. As I said, his, his testimony has dispelled any questions I had on those points so that I am now, as I have said, uh, unreservedly convinced that he would make an outstanding Supreme Court justice, not only with respect to all the qualities of character that you've touched on, but with respect to his contribution to the adjudication of the inherently difficult issues that will always divide a body of nine justices. Do you know of anything against him that would prevent him making a good Supreme Court justice? No. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator from Massachusetts, Senator Kennedy. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Uh, Chairman. Um, Richardson and I uh, join in extending a warm uh, welcome uh, to you. We're extremely pleased to have you uh, here today. You've served our country with honor and distinction in a broad variety of uh, positions. But I think most Americans will probably remember and admire you most for your actions as Attorney General. Uh, during 1973 when you demonstrated your commitment to the rule of law by resigning rather than obey President Nixon's order to fire Archibald Cox as the Watergate Special Prosecutor. You later wrote in your book, The Creative Balance, that President Nixon's entire effort at that time was directed at getting rid of Archibald Cox as Special Prosecutor so that he would not obtain the incriminating White House tapes. You wrote, and I quote, I was finally forced to conclude that from the beginning of the week, the name of the game had been get rid of Cox, get rid of him by resignation if possible, but get rid of him. And we all remember the courageous action you took, Mr. Richardson, in standing up for the rule of law. Judge Bork chose a different and a much more controversial course at one of the most critical moments of our history. Judge Bork obeyed the order of a corrupt president and denied uh, the rule of law. Federal judge uh, later ruled that Judge Bork had acted illegally. Judge Bork has claimed that the regulations were only a technicality and that everything turned out all right. But you and I lived uh, through those uh, days uh, together, Mr. Richardson, seven days in October of 1973, and it was by no means clear to either of us that everything would turn out all right. The firestorm of public criticism had a great deal to do with the fact that everything did turn out all right. And so did your uh, courageous actions, Mr. Richardson. We can't say the same about Judge Bork's actions, and that is one of the reasons why this nomination 
is so controversial. I have no questions. May I uh, respond, Mr. Chairman? Please. Uh, I, I uh, very much appreciate uh, Senator Kennedy's uh, allusions to and quotations from my book. I'm sorry it's out of print. But his quotation was also somewhat selective. He alluded to those seven days in October and to the aftermath of the so-called Saturday Night Massacre and to the fact that it did turn out all right. It turned all out all right, Senator Kennedy, in significant part because of the role played by Robert H. Bork. One of the concerns that Bill Ruckelshaus and I had in urging him to stay on was that there would be a situation fraught with enormous tension that anyone in the position of acting attorney general be, would be subject to great pressure and that it was vital that the continuity of the Watergate investigation and the integrity of the Watergate special prosecuting force be maintained. Judge Bork, from the very moment that he became acting attorney general and after the firing of Archibald Cox, fulfilled that commitment to the integrity of the special Watergate prosecution force. As testimony before this committee has brought out, as early as Monday, he was already seeking advice from the American Bar Association as to individuals who might capably serve as a successor to Archibald Cox. And uh, I think, as I also acknowledge in that book, uh, a few pages further on, I think the nation owes a substantial debt to Robert Bork for his services in that situation. Been uh, some that uh, suggested that he uh, could have uh, fired Archibald de Cox and then uh, after the, uh, the hours of the immediate days of the establishment of a special prosecutor, we're going to hear more testimony in, on that particular issue, that he uh, could have resigned and uh, that uh, the continuity would have uh, continued in terms of the power appointment that uh, exists within the, the president, and that that would have been a more uh, satisfactory way of uh, proceeding. I, 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 with respect, Senator, it seems to me a silly suggestion. Why would the best possible man to be acting attorney general uh, quit after having gone through with the most distasteful and painful part of the job? He'd already done that. We, his, his original idea, as I've testified this morning and as my book also notes, was to carry out the firing and then resign. He was concerned that, as he put it, he would be viewed as an apparatchik, that the, the, the opprobrium attached to that term would uh, impair his usefulness as, as acting attorney general. Bill Ruckelhaus and I uh, talked him out of that. We said that's not a sufficient reason for you to resign, and we eventually convinced him of this with the beneficial uh, contribution to the public interest that I've just mentioned. I'd add, too, Senator, that I, I touched on this business about the illegality of the firing uh, on uh, page two of my prepared statement. I, with, again, with respect to uh, Judge Gazelle, uh, his version of the, quote, regulation, unquote, uh, has always seemed to me excessively legalistic. It didn't occur to anyone uh, on Saturday, October 20, 1973, that uh, the mere fact that my agreement with Archibald Cox had been published in the Federal Register constituted a legal barrier to Mr. Bork's action. Uh, I don't believe it did. I already had, had a, as I said, a, an opinion of the Office of Legal Counsel of the Department of Justice, the effect that president could have fired Cox himself at any time. Uh, he was certainly entitled to get it done. 
problem I had, the problem Bill Ruckel's house had, was the problem arising out of the fact that the terms of Cox's charter had been negotiated with Cox and with this committee, as you would well remember. Uh, but uh, the, the, the question of whether the order should have been rescinded or when it was rescinded uh, seems to me uh, a very inconsequential in the light of the circumstances as a whole. Well, could I uh, just finish on the uh, thought? Uh, I remember uh, during the, uh, the course of those uh, hearings in establishing the uh, special prosecutor and uh, the issuing of uh, the various regulations, the exchange that you had with Senator Mathias that I believe was referred to actually in Judge Gazelle's ruling. Senator Mathias, that brings me to one further question on the guidelines. Had you considered the mechanism by which you finally published them? They could be published in the Federal Register in the manner in which the Department regulations are published, could they not? Uh, Mr. Richardson, that is what I expected to do because to a degree they supersede the regulations that provide for delegation, for example, to the Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division in certain respects. And so therefore, the most effective way of making sure that they do as a matter of law supersede the existing regulations to give them the same legal status through publication in the Federal Register. And I think that that is, uh, at least as my uh, understanding, reason why Judge Gazelle uh, believed that uh, they did have uh, the power of the rule of law in, the, uh, in his uh, decision and that was later upheld in the uh, Nixon uh, case. The, well, I think the operative words there, Senator, are the same status. Um, Arrangements involving the delegation of functions to individuals within an executive department where those functions are not prescribed or limited by statute is a matter that uh, the head of a department can address at any time. Certainly that has always been my assumption. So the, the, uh, so the agreement was really just between you and the committee? That was what I thought. You really believed that at the heights of the Watergate uh, crisis, that the arrangements that were made with the Judiciary Committee was only limited to you as an individual and not in terms of the uh, institution that was yes. set up. That was the issue, if you recall. That, well, During the I, reason I, I, why the, the hearings took so long was that it was my position that as Attorney General of the United States, I could not abdicate responsibility for the investigation. And uh, I therefore insisted on reserving uh, the power to fire Cox. The issue then became one of for what, which of course led to the phrase only for extraordinary improprieties on his part. So it was just but limited to you. it was a confirmation you. hearing of me. The understandings were understandings arrived at as conditions for the willingness of this committee to report out the nomination. It was never suggested to my knowledge at any point in the hearings that, that the, the, this understanding would have the force of law or be binding on any future attorney general. That was precisely what I wanted to resist. I, I fought against the creation of some external mechanism beyond my accountability as Attorney General, comparable, for example, to the present status of a, an independent counsel, in order to maintain accountability. Uh, the members of the committee uh, resisted that. They, were, they wanted to have some device that would assure that the independence of the special prosecutor was not thus subject to my overall uh, eventual responsibility. Uh, and that is why the, the uh, charter came out the way it did and had the status that I have always believed it to have. In any case, the really key point, I think, is is that on October 20, 1973, whatever may a judge might later conclude on looking at the testimony 
looking at the charter, looking at the regulations, these considerations did not even arise. Well, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I just uh, asked to put in the record the various the regulations. They were worked out. As a member of this committee, I remember very clearly, very much involved with that, and I have enormous regard and respect for my uh, good friend, uh, Ambassador Secretary Richardson, but I think it goes beyond imagination that the members of this committee were thinking that all of this was just established for Mr. Richardson and not the office. The last regulation or the duration of the assignment, the special prosecutor will carry out these responsibilities with the full support of the Department of Justice till such time as in his judgment he has completed them or until, until a date mutually agreed upon between the Attorney General and himself. And um, as a member of that committee, I think it's uh, very clear both from the record uh, and the history and what this uh, country was faced with is that this was not a personal contract with Mr. Richardson, but it was dealing with the office itself. But we, that's beyond really what this hearing is uh, uh, about, but I um, do appreciate the uh, chance to include those matters in the, uh, in the record. Without objection, they'll be included. Senator Hatch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, uh, General Richardson. We're grateful to have you here today. I, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Specter has to leave, but he has one question. So let me yield to him for the one question, then I'd like to make some points. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Hatch. I appreciate your yielding to me. I uh, must leave in a moment or two, and there was just one point that I wanted to ask you about, uh, uh, Mr. Attorney General. Uh, you point out at page three of your statement that it was essential to maintain the continuity of the Watergate investigation and that uh, Judge Bork took immediate steps to keep the Watergate special prosecution force together. And the one factual question which uh, I would like to have answered, although I uh, don't know how much weight this has really on the proceeding as a whole, but I would be interested to know uh, your understanding of the facts, because I have heard it reported that the initial position taken by Judge Bork was to return the uh, Watergate Special Prosecution Task Force to the Department of Justice, to Mr. Peterson, who was then the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Criminal Division. And it was only after the public furor arose that the matter was returned to uh, Mr. Ruth and others on the uh, special task force. As to these events, Senator Specter, I was, of course, uh, not a, a first-hand witness. Uh, what I uh, know about them uh, derives partly from what I was being told by by uh, former associates in the department at the time, I was, of course, acutely interested and concerned. Um, some of what I I, um, I now I'm now aware of is uh, what I've been reminded of in in uh, recent weeks. And uh, to some extent from um, other sources, so uh, it's a little hard to know what I, exactly I knew then. But I, I could only say that that I, I, my understanding of of Bob Bork's role, as I wrote in my book, goes even beyond uh, what I think uh, it may actually have been. Uh, I, I thought that he had, from the outset, insisted that there must be a new special prosecutor, that he had re directly resisted the president's uh, directive to return responsibility for the investigation to the assistant attorney general, Henry Peterson. When I resigned in the afternoon of October 20, the president told me that this is what he intended to do and that he intended to, dis to get the Watergate Special Prosecution Force disbanded. Uh, I'm satisfied from all that I know that from the outset, Bob Bork was first of all determined to make sure that the Special Prosecution Force 
was kept intact so that it could carry on the investigation. The question at the outset as to whether it was under Peterson as Assistant Attorney General was a secondary question as long as the, the, the people involved, Ruth and Lacavara and others, uh, were in charge of the investigation itself. Uh, and of course, whatever may have been the, the, the uncertainties as to, to the Peterson role from the afternoon of October 20, uh, those uncertainties were certainly removed very quickly when, when uh, Bob Bork uh, uh, began to pursue the replacement of Archibald Cox. That's really about all I know. I, I don't think I, I think I don't think there's any basis for the impression that he was ever a part of any any effort originating in the White House to undercut the integrity or the continuity of the investigation. Thank you very much, Mr. Attorney General. Thank you, Senator Hatch. Senator Hepp. General, if you had not uh, made a commitment to the Judiciary Committee, would you have fired Archibald Cox? Well, that's, a, that's an impossible question. Uh, I believe that the role of the special prosecutor should be independent from outside interference. Uh, I, uh, I'll have to go back. When the president asked me to become attorney general in May, he left to me the question whether or not a special prosecutor should be appointed at all. Uh, I thought about that for about a week, more or less, and, and announced at the end of that period that I concluded that I, I should appoint a special prosecutor. I gave as my principal reason the fact that I had been associated with the Nixon administration from the beginning, and that although I felt confident of my own ability to carry out or assume responsibility for the investigation without being subject to external pressure from the White House or anywhere else, nevertheless, I thought that public confidence in the investigation would be enhanced if it were placed in the hands of a special prosecutor. Um, so, and I, 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 I think that my announcement uh, addressed the, the essentiality of his independence. Certainly in any case, from my very first discussion with Archibald Cox himself, uh, the question of how his independence would be expressed and respected uh, was at the very forefront of our discussions. Uh, it was clear that he would only take the job if uh, he were satisfied on this score. And in fact, he and I had reached what was to us a, an adequate understanding on that point before the uh, the, the further concerns about it were expressed by this committee. So uh, the question of my firing Cox uh, could not have arisen under any circumstances which I was involved if the basis of firing him uh, had not been uh, clearly founded on uh, some impropriety in his uh, part, some demonstration of incapacity, uh, or something else that, that uh, would, in fact, uh, have been extremely unlikely. The, the issue, therefore, became one of, of, of uh, the, the inherent power of the president 
over the executive branch and executive branch employees. Uh, this was the question addressed uh, in, the, in the memorandum I mentioned earlier by the Office of Legal Counsel, which concluded that the President could have fired Cox himself regardless of the charter. Um, I, I, uh, I felt strongly that the grounds on which the President uh, wanted Cox fired were a mistake apart from the Charter because they included a restriction on Cox's access to tapes not already subpoenaed. And I spent much of Friday uh, trying to convince the White House that that, that restriction should not be uh, proposed. In fact, I spent much of the week trying to fight it off. So I guess uh, that's a long way of saying so that I can't, I can't place myself in that hypothetical situation. Well, I gather from your answer, you, you indicate that uh, you, in effect, made a commitment to the committee. You made a commitment to Archibald Cox on his independency in the role. Do you consider that uh, those commitments, well, I'll ask you this, do you consider that your commitment to Cox was between you and him and did not inure to your successor? Yes. As I so, as my prepared statement says, I, I thought that I think I thought that the uh, that his successor could, of course, conclude that he should uh, renew this understanding with Cox or with a successor to Cox, but that whether he did or not was not controlled by what I had done. I was I I. I as I said to Senator Kennedy, we never would have had the protracted hearings that we had. I wouldn't have had to negotiate with individual senators, particularly Senator Hart of Michigan, over this issue if I had not said, I am not going to take over the Department of Justice on any terms that place my ultimate responsibility toward this investigation on a different footing than anything else in the department. So the question was, how do you square that circle? How do you, how do you assure independence on the one side? And what I said, in effect, is I, I will observe these understandings. And as far as I was concerned, uh, that was it. That, that a, a, the committee, if, if, if these understandings had not voluntarily been sustained by a, a second attorney general, would have had to uh, take steps to reinstate them. One further question. Do you think that your advocacy to Robert Bork to stay on as prosecutor and to comply with the president's request was a violation of your commitment of independence to Mr. Cox? I didn't think it was a violation of my commitment. Uh, I, uh, I was already out, or on the way out. I'm a little unclear as to how much of the discussion took place uh, after the Cox press conference and before I went to the White House and how much of it took place when I came back. In any case, uh, as I've said, um, I believe that the, the, uh, the President uh, would accomplish the firing in one way or another. I believe that he had the legal right to do so. Uh, I believe that, that uh, Bork 
was not personally subject to the same commitments and was thus personally free to go forward with this action and that his doing so in the circumstances was in the public interest. I was concerned that if he didn't, uh, as I said, a chain reaction could follow, meaning that if he resigned, uh, the dominoes could fall uh, indefinitely far down the line, leading, leaving the department without a strong and adequately qualified leader. That was a very practical concern. We had a situation in which uh, not only Ruckelshaus and I, but, but all my uh, top staff were, were, were uh, uh, picking up and, and leaving. Um, so uh, I, uh, as I say, I, I, didn't, I didn't think that, that uh, Bork was bound, Cox would be out, question was, I would be out. The question really was a practical matter was, uh, how, do you, how do you maintain the continuity and the integrity of the investigation in these circumstances? Time is up. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hatch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, I welcome you, uh, uh, Mr. Richardson, to, to our committee. I think you've put to bed this issue of Watergate. It should have been put to bed many years ago. And I think by your prior statements, and, uh, but you've done it again here today. And I, I thought it was very interesting when Professor Oakes, who testified yesterday, uh, uh, whose reputation is absolutely impeccable, as is yours, uh, made it very clear that uh, Robert Bork was instrumental in, the, in obtaining uh, Leon Jaworski, who finally did really put uh, the Watergate matter behind all of us. So I don't know why all the fuss anyway. But let me just take a few minutes. Uh, this type of fuss is part of what I'm going to go into for just a few minutes at this time. From the outset of this debate, we've all been barraged with politics. We've been lobbied, we've been lied to, we've been led astray by charges and counter charges. And perhaps the key example of this phenomenon has been the full page ads that have been put in the newspapers uh, that are really offensive. These ads mischaracterize, they misconstrue, they mislead, and I think they distort Judge Bork's record with regard to his record. Now, just to test these theses that these articles mislead, I picked up one of these ads and put it together. And uh, in just a short while, I decided to analyze it, and I illustrated uh, 67 falsehoods in this one full-page ad put out by People for the American Way. Now, I can't go into all the falsehoods, so I would ask unanimous consent that these 67 flaws that I've uh, put together uh, be placed in the record at this uh, point, uh, Mr. Chairman. Sure. What I'd like to do is just go through a few of them. Take uh, number 21, where it says, quote, use of contraceptives by married couples of punishable crime, unquote. Clearly put in there to be inflammatory, because this leaves the impression that married couples were convicted of such a crime. And as judge, uh, do, you, do you have a copy of these so I can take yes, a look while you're going? Yeah, Thanks, because sure I can't see your. Well, give me that copy. Now, Judge Bork, as he mentioned, he said that this.